do it. Yeah, no. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming in today. For those that are listening after the fact, today is April 5th. Um, today we're joined by Marty and crew, as well as some of the Premia guys. Um, I'm DK. Um, I run Operations and Legal at Premia, um, but I have a 10-year background in TradeFi. Cozy. I handle business development at Premia, and I'm a degenerate trader on-chain. I'm Tolu Gucheri. Uh, I work in the research department, doing everything research and development. And Johnny, Johnny and Lil Quant, whenever you guys are ready. Hey guys, um, is my voice coming through fine? I'm in an airport, so it's a bit, uh, so might be some background noise. Yep. Um, yeah, my name is Johnny. Um, I was a market maker doing uh, Euro dollar, SOFR, Fed funds, BISB, and other uh, fixed income and interest rate options uh, at the CME. Um, I also dabbled a bit in corn, wheat, and soybeans, um, futures and options market making, and just in general, if, if the Merck listed it, um, I got involved in it. Um, so did that, did that for a couple of years, and then uh, not trying to, to work on something of my own. And uh, hopefully I can update you guys with that in a couple months. Good good news. Exciting. Uh, I guess you guys can call me Loquant. Um, I don't, your guys' resume sounds much more impressive than mine's. I'm pretty much just the, I did car sales for about five years and now I'm just a student or a data science, but I read, read a lot about options, I guess. Well, mine's not that impressive. I'm a art school dropout turned vault trader. So. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Pretty impressive. Yeah. Malay today I just Discord. wanted to. Yeah, today I just wanted to cover a few things. So last week we had a huge uh, Darabit trade that rolled over to CME and talk about the implications of that. Or it, it suspected that they closed the trade on Darabit and opened it on CME. It was bought back in March. They closed it. It seemed that they closed it recently, last week, and then reopened it on CME. And then we can talk about the current vol regime and what's been going on in vol. We can go into institutional flows. And then the last five, 10 minutes, we can open it up to questions. Questions have been pretty light every time. So I hope somebody has a question. I would appreciate it. Uh, Marty, can we start off by just maybe going over the the details of that trade just as like a kind of a, a primer for everyone? Uh, I thought that was you know, you're talking about the uh, the 600 lot spread, correct on uh, BTC? Yeah, so somebody nobody knows who they uh, it was a, probably one of the biggest prints we've seen in a long time. It seems that they bought it in. March on Darabit, I don't know, through Paradigm or, or directly on book, but it was around uh, $18 million, $19 million worth. They bought uh, the May 32-38 spread, 38K spread, um, but on CME, the contract multiplier is five, so... Uh, yeah, it, it, it turns out that they paid what three million, four million, and the max upside profit would have been eighteen million at maturity. But yeah, it was like a three million dollar, four million dollar order, if I remember correctly. And I guess just the implications of that, we could talk about it. But the, everybody's suspecting like that they didn't want to take counterparty risk, right? So nobody knows Darabit's books. Nobody knows how liquid they are. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine getting an $18 million order through, but, um, you know, maybe their it's risk also, department um, or somebody else knocked on their shoulder. It's also a uh, Merck. So a Bitcoin option at the Merck will settle into a Bitcoin future. And then the Bitcoin futures are then like cash settled. Um, and I think that's also a big play in it. Um, 
because let's say it settles in between the two strikes or something, you're not going to be long 3,000 Bitcoin and have to unwind that um, either through OTC desks or at market. Um, it'll just be cash settled um, and you're able to uh, see whether that, I guess, whether your trade worked out instead of having to deal with the headache of unwinding your trade once it worked out. Do you have any speculation on, on who it is or who it could be? Uh, I don't know, but I know Cumberland would know. Cumberland would know. Probably. Yeah, I would agree there. But I guess I guess the counterparty risk, right, is Deribit goes down during your trade. That's like worst case scenario, right? End game. Uh, yeah, and even... I don't know if, if Deribit is, is your counterparty in all trades or whether there's, you know, like Marty, whether you would be the um, the counterparty in that case. I mean, if you get margin called or something, that looks a huge problem for everybody versus with America, you got to go through clearing houses. Um, and that takes a lot of that counterparty risk out. Was anybody else following that trade or was that just uh, something that popped up on the, on the Twitter feed? Marty only told me the first time uh, when he asked me whether I had heard about it and why someone, uh, like my read on why someone would go go ahead and do something like this. Um, I, I don't trade with the Merc as much anymore since leaving. Um, and most of my kind of like connections and circles and uh, whatnot are kind of in the interest rate, uh, which is the most capital efficient institutional market on the planet uh, and those guys, you know, kind of really hate crypto and getting involved in crypto. And so if I even probably ask them, you know, did you guys hear about uh, these 600 spreads going through, they would uh, probably report me to the CFTC or something. It's a scammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, also right, like, like three, 3 million in premium premium isn't like, that much, right? Like in institutional, right? Like, oh, you look at spy options or Tesla options or whatever, you know, they're doing numbers on that. It just is big, big for us in our small gray box that we live in. Yeah, well, I think it really matters um, when you talk to market makers and stuff and you uh, talk about how big an order is, um, they don't really care about it in dollar terms. They more so care about it in vol terms. And so if someone goes and clips $3 million in the at the money straddle, everyone's going to be freaking out. Well, if you go ahead and spray some, let's say like super wingy flies or something, like no one cares. Like someone went ahead and lifted those for a quarter or whatever. You're like, whatever. Like you'll deal with that if it comes up to it. But it's not that big of a deal like in money terms. Yeah, there was a guy last at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, that was just up so much every play that he kept doing year, you know, month over month or quarter every quarter. I forgot exactly what he was doing. But he ended up spending like around a million bucks on some random butterfly that if ETH was exactly 3000 he would 30x. And the contract ended up only being like 30 bucks or something. Like, oh, God, imagine that one cash, you know, 750K, 800K on a 30X if, if it was exactly 3,000. Yeah, people do that all the time. Um, like, you know, if you're, if you're up on the year or something, you're like, screw it, like, free, free spin, and you toss it on some crazy wing fly or something that, uh, like we used to do with the interest rates where, and this was when rates were zero, it was before the Fed pivoted. They were like, oh, you know, if interest rates go negative, which when interest rates were zero and Japan had already been like negative and it wasn't the craziest thing to think about. It was like, oh, we're putting a hundred grand on these to win 12 million if interest rates go negative. It's like, it's not the worst thing in the world if you're playing with profits. Yeah, you know, 100K on a swing is an institutional level, right? Yeah, you're just betting. You're just betting like the one in the million, you know, 
it just hits. Okay, but yeah, he cashed for sure. Yeah, now, I, I think still it see this on more as a directional play, though, here. Because, I mean, it, given that it's a spread, unless something happened to, like, upside skew where it got a bit rich and someone was looking to capitalize on that, um, I'm not sure this is, like, really, like, a vol play, per se. I'm not sure you're getting... Um, uh, I don't see the primary uh, desire for this exposure for that particular reason. Maybe from like a, a you know from the vol perspective, I kind of still see this as a, a more of a directional play. But then again, uh, you know, you guys are just kind of going into like who is this and what does it mean. I I think we could talk you know uh, for hours on that, and there's a million different ways. Um, that risk desks can look at uh, exposures and conjure up uh, different trade combos that would mitigate some of the risks that they have, whether it be to the upside or downside. Um, and so uh, I, I thought, you know, one of the things here that struck me as relatively interesting was uh, in the thread, there's a mention of uh, last year, the open interest from a market share perspective the CME was 5%, and now it's 22%. Um, that's a pretty big jump. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at some point, we, we, we talk about this a lot, but Derivit being the only show in town uh, is only going to last so long. And so I think at some point, someone is going to have to dethrone them where there's going to be some extra competition that comes in um, hopefully premia from the DeFi standpoint. Uh, but it is interesting to see that CME has taken a big chunk of the market share. I just don't see the data if it's actually stealing market share from Deribit or if it's just an increase in flow that's transitioning to uh, CME uh, just from an exposure standpoint. Institutions just prefer going to CME instead of Deribit. I'm not sure if you guys have any color on that. Yeah, I can shine a little bit of light. No U.S. based firm fund company that has UBO, U.S. U.S. Uh, investors. No, not U.S. investors, but a U.S. based entity can't trade on Deribit, right? So where are you going to go now post FTX? You had Ledger X where you could get off some block trade size, you know, five hundred ETH, a thousand Bitcoin. If you if you really pushed, you could get off a thousand Bitcoin. So maybe the flow is just there's nowhere else to go in the States for these U.S. entities, right? Everybody else is offshore and they're able to trade their bid or whatever, OKX, buy a bit, DeFi, whatever. Um, but if you're stuck in the U.S. and if your capital is stuck in the U.S., then your only way to trade legally is CME or Ledger X, but now Ledger X is poof. Does LedgerX even have any decent volume? Uh, have they even... I haven't really looked at them. Uh, are they even still a player? No, no, no. Af after FTX... No, after FTX... Um, well, right before the crash, they had Bitcoin and ETH for retail. And then on the back end, there was an institutional chat where you could go off book, like OTC, in between individual players. So you, if... If somebody was there to take that trade or wanted to take that trade, you could get off any size, right? It was really, for me, it was really hard to get off over 500 ETH. Um, and if you really, really, really pushed a few of the few of the main guys, you could get, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 Bitcoin, right? Which is, which is a lot, right? But you really had to push. Now, uh, LedgerX doesn't offer Ethereum to retail. They just have Bitcoin. And the institutional chat is dead. And yeah, I guess your only outlook is uh, CME if you're a US-based entity trying to trade crypto. Do you guys know of any other OTC market um, other than like uh, Paradigm and uh, the, the system that they have in place? Because I, I believe they just settled to Deribit. Uh, I'm wondering if that there's like an institutional link between that um, OTC um, environment and then linking that in some ways to now the CME, essentially just overflowing 
uh, the liquidity back and forth between the well, two. Par- Paradigm does uh, CME, Darabit, and Bybit, I want to say, but Bybit options suck. There's no liquidity. Um, so, yeah, maybe people are settling through there. What I know also is you can go directly to Genesis and you can settle through Paradigm on either one of those, but you can specifically pick Genesis to be your counterparty if you want. Um, you know, they have a minimum size. I think it's five, 500 ETH, right, is minimum size. Um, a lot of this stuff, if you want to go, like, directly to Genesis and trade directly against Genesis, not through Paradigm, you you need to have an ISDA and all kinds of other sort of legality paperwork, which, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have. Some people do, but most don't have. So Paradigm seems to be the biggest player right now connecting institution to institution and institution to pro tail, right? Because Paradigm still has a minimum size as well. I think it's 150 on a, 100, 125 on a spread and 250 on a single contract. Have you heard of uh, Greeks? I think they partner with Deribit and they facilitate some block trades as well too. Greeks Live? Yeah. But I don't think that would be U.S., yeah. Yeah. Still not U.S. Though. Yeah. Greeks Live does have a block block trade. It's kind of like this uh, um, this Genesis deal, right? So you contact Genesis directly, or or Greeks Jeff over at Greeks Live directly, and oh, I want to get this order, but it's still settled through Darabit, right? So for for right now, there's no U.S. player that can get on Darabit, right? Mm-hmm. You have to go offshore. You have to go to BVI, Cayman whatever, Luxembourg, whatever, right? So maybe that's, Tolga, maybe that's why you're seeing this influx of market share because people want to trade it, but there's no space to. You can't, besides on the CME. I don't know if it's an uptick of interest per se, right? Like, oh, now all these funds want to trade Bitcoin options. Mm, I think there was always people that wanted to trade Bitcoin options, but this is now the only place to. I think when it comes to, I think when it comes to the, uh, in terms of the CME and stuff, when I checked a couple of years ago, there was absolutely no liquidity in the options chain and the futures were, you know, quoted to sometimes three ticks wide, two to three contracts up. And so this is like horrific levels of liquidity. Um, I know that the CME will launch market maker incentive programs where they will pay people, you know, sometimes it could be 10 to 15 grand a month to just stand and quote both sides with certain tightness, I guess. Um, It's very possible that they launch something like that within the past year or so. And that's what's caused, like you guys have said, like people have always wanted to trade Bitcoin options. They just literally didn't have a market. So the Merc comes in and says, we'll pay anyone 10K a month to just stand on both sides. And then that gives a venue for people to start trading. I think that this gives an opportunity, right, for for DeFi to come in. And I don't know if it's full DeFi, right? Options on full DeFi is, is hard. I, a lot of people right now are working on full DeFi. Some are working on centralized order books. Um, I think the future is full DeFi, but we have some speed bumps and some things to build through before we get to like that smooth order book style, right? Where you click and it's filled. Um, you know, there's still a, microsecond delay where maybe the price changes or or you know you don't you can't fill your spread or you can't build a butterfly on some DeFi. so it's going to be interesting to see what what premia comes out with on the v3 i hear it's very important yeah i mean like some of the major issues kind of boil down to two things that we keep talking about in research as our our primary focus and bottlenecks Um, the first and most obvious is uh, capital efficiency, right? Um, And so being in DeFi, if you need, if you want something or if you have a desire for something to be a primitive, uh, the only way to ensure uh, 
that it's never insolvent is to be fully collateralized, right? And so somewhere, somehow, you have to come up with uh, units of collateral, actual cash that exists uh, to cover exposures, right? Whereas uh, in centralized entities, uh, it's more or less a fractional reserve banking system style uh, design, right? The risk-based metrics where all the capital doesn't actually exist. Uh, it's just within uh, a certain tolerance uh, that they would be able to guarantee things. It's never fully guaranteed. They also have the luxury of being able to stop markets and do other things to prevent you know, extreme scenarios from, from happening. So that's kind of our biggest uh, challenge is how do we provide margin um, that is capital efficient, both from uh, a user standpoint and also from an interest rate and lending standpoint. So uh, those are some of the things we're tackling now. We ended up launching, or we will be launching uh, our first iteration of margin, which is more of a risk-based design instead of right T. So we are trying to move in the direction of portfolio margin and take one step closer uh, in that direction. Uh, and then hopefully by the second half of this year, uh, we should have a white paper release of a uh, portfolio margin design V2, right? That we would uh, begin implement, like production and implement, implementation of. Um, the other major factor that I see uh, that we keep talking about a, a lot is Delta hedging, right? And so between capital efficiency of options and having a venue to Delta hedge, uh, those are extremely important things. And so, again, when you're trying to delta hedge, it comes back into uh, lending. Uh, so if you want to get short spot market, you obviously have to borrow it from somewhere. Uh, if you're not borrowing it, uh, you're using another derivative like a perp, right? And so there's basically two avenues in DeFi you can go for delta hedging. Um, it's either perps, uh, which are a derivative themselves, or a lending market. Uh, lending markets are, are significantly more capital uh, intensive. Uh, but they're more sound, right? Uh, um, in, in terms of uh, everyone's made, everyone can be made whole. Uh, on the perp side, uh, obviously, I think everyone's pretty familiar with how perpetuals work. Uh, one of the nice things about perpetuals, but it's a double-edged sword, is the the leverage. And so, one of the problems we've noticed with delta hedging is a lot of these DeFi perpetual protocols have limitations into how much capital. Um, you can actually borrow from them. So I'll give an example. Uh, you know, GMX is a, a pretty popular DeFi uh, venue for perps. And they have a pool in which uh, you can trade against and you can trade perpetuals on. Uh, they provide up to 50x leverage, which is, uh, I guess, depending on what you want, um, they try to cater to all people. One of the bottlenecks of this, though, is if someone uh, pulls a 20x trade, um, the pool itself has to have that 20x of capital. So for example, if, if a buyer comes in and they have $1,000 and they want to do a 20x trade uh, on their $1,000, $20,000 of the capital in the AMM, uh, in the perpetual AMM, is actually locked up. And so one of the things you see with GMX uh, as being a popular product is it's not always available. Capital is not always available to Delta hedge. And so if you're an option trader, how exactly are you going to Delta hedge if the venue in which you picked doesn't have available capital to do so? Um, and so that brings up other questions. And one of the things we're looking to just to kind of bring this full circle with margin, um, when you want to implement portfolio margin, you have to marry that with Delta hedging. They are within the same bucket, and it's extremely difficult to separate the two. And so one of the things we're going to explore is trying to find a more designated uh, delta hedging location for us. Uh, it, it's likely that it could be an in-house product, um, mainly because that way we can manage the risk exposures. We know of someone's exposure. And again, with the difference between CFI and DeFi, in CFI, when you do an option trade in your account, you typically also do the spot trades in your account. And so from a risk standpoint, they can see this. But in DeFi, if you go to another protocol and do a Delta hedge, we have no idea if you have a hedge on or not. And so we have to get that information. 
And if we have that information, we also need that capital. Because if one of those positions loses a lot of money, the other one's going to make a lot of money, right? And those need to offset each other. And that capital can't be on two separate exchanges. It needs to be in one location. And so those are one of the things that we're uh, exploring this year as well. I apologize for the long-winded uh, response there. It's okay. It's okay. Don't get froggy in here, okay? He'll just make it another 30 minutes. But when you guys talk about putting it on one platform, I think that's the only way, right? You can't – it's really hard to – in DeFi right now, especially for us, it's like, oh, let's say we take something on – premium then we need to go somewhere else to to hedge it off we're on something like garabit we can just run our you know our bot and every few seconds it, it's auto correcting you know the whole book automatically right you don't have to you can add delta you, you can keep adding deltas or make it back to zero however you want to play your book are you guys going to open up the full api and have full algo trading on the delta hedging side Uh, do you mean like third-party uh, Delta venues where we could provide Delta hedging services, or are you talking about in-house? Um... I guess both. Yeah, I don't know. It could it could be in-house, or or you or you do it for somebody else, a different like you guys become the home of Delta hedging for DeFi. I don't know in a simple one-liner, you know, on a well, balloon yeah, idea. And so the we want to do that. I think it's a bit ambitious, but uh, the reason why we, we would want to aim high enough to do that is because there is no other choice. I don't think there's anything that exists currently that would allow us to uh, safely scale and, and continue with a capital efficient portfolio margin system. So if it doesn't exist, you got to build it. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's really any other option. Um, the, the idea that I believe that we can implement is by taking, uh, we have to provide full collateralization on options, which means we have to have a lending market that provides the collateral. This lending market can also be a lending market for spot if someone wants to delta hedge. And so if we have that in house, then we can provide uh, direct connectivity, right? So through our API, you can just um, connect to our pools um, these pools are already uh, cross collateralized with the option pools, right? So you, you would actually be able to have a full aggregated exposure and it would give you that one step closer to that traditional feel that you get on CFI, right? Yeah. I think that that's the only way for DeFi to grow, right? If, even if there's like a, on the, on the UI side, right? Like, Oh, you click a, the order and it takes five seconds you're like well that was too long you know maybe the price had moved against you or you know you weren't filled on, on various different venues right let's take like zeta for example right you're on solano oh my god it's the fastest chain ever and you want to i don't know put in a limit well then some bot just fronts run your limit you know by one penny or whatever it is and then you know the price moves against you and you never get filled because you're waiting to sign every single transaction in your wallet, right? It's just delayed, even though it seems fast or it's on the fastest chain, it's just delayed. Um, obviously API, you know, you're not dealing with that, but for the end user, you're always on this, uh, this delay is, is premium going to move to like a full, you know, person to person order book, or are you guys going to just keep the AMM? I think it's really just going to be a hybrid of a lot of market types. Um, and so uh, we sort of earmarked three market types that we think uh, users like. Um, and who knows which one will be successful. It's very hard to kind of uh, tell uh, what will work. Uh, I think some part of it's about, you know, technology and timing. Um, but right now we do see the order book side as um uh, Order, order, we'll call it order book and RFQ, right? Very similar traditional methods of, of market data. Um, then there's the AMM side, right? So traditional to say Uniswap V3, like concentrated liquidity. To me, concentrated liquidity is sort of this like um, scaling factor between like a clunky AMM that's capital inefficient to a full scale uh, order book. 
And depending on your technology stack, your concentrated liquidity design can orders can get more and more concentrated, right? And there's more and more functionality uh, that users can do that will mimic more of an order book style. Uh, and then there's the the pure passive users. So there's always going to be a passive user somewhere, right? And then, so even in traditional markets, you see it in like ETFs, uh, mutual funds, and so. Vaults are, are another category that, uh, you know, is tried and true, a DeFi uh, area of demand. And so uh, we're doing all three. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is we're going to be developing all three. And uh, what happens from there is kind of hard to tell. Um, what people will adopt to or adapt to, um, what uh, what technology stacks will come out that will allow us to do things that will make one of those three uh, have a competitive advantage, uh, you know, still yet to be seen. Like one thing that we uh, came across, well, I think it was relatively new to me. Um, Uniswap came out with something called Permit 2. Um, if, if, uh, most people in DeFi, you know, when you do a transaction, uh, prior to doing that transaction, you have to do an approval, right? And so you have to tell that ERC-20 token, hey, I'm allowing this protocol to trade um, this token for me or take this token from me. And then after you do that approval, you have to go and then do the transaction yourself. And you have to do this for every single ERC-20. Now, in, in our situation, we have lots of options. Each one of them is an ERC-20. Uh, well, an 1155 uh, token standard, but... Uh, they follow each individual option follows like sort of an ERC 20 standard. Um, you need to provide approvals for, for all of those before a transaction. So that's super clunky, but the permit to design that Uniswap came out with allows people in DeFi now to approve and do the transaction all in one, uh, one go. Right. And so I know the one biggest like pain point for people when they're trading in, in DeFi is the amount of clicks you have to do just to do a single trade. You have to do the, the blind signing off of your ledger. And then once the approvals gets through, then you have to do the transaction itself. And then, like you said, then there's someone front running you. Uh, then the price change. And suddenly you have to refresh the order. So that user experience has a lot of friction to it. Um, will it ever go away? I don't know. Uh, but if it does... Um, you know, you could make a case for AMMs uh, for sure. Uh, but as of right now, order book designs and centralized bottle points or bottlenecks are, are still the easiest way to alleviate some of those frictions um, until the tech stack catches up. Yeah, that's what everybody's looking at, right? They're looking at like doing a DYDX type thing where it's a centralized order book. So the UI isn't clunky. And then users have custody over their own funds, um, uh, which, you know, s sounds sounds great on paper until, you know, your whole team is building a, a derivatives product in the U.S. and, you know, it gets shut down like a DYDX example, let's say in the future, right? They have a New York and SF headquarters. The whole team is based, you know, most of the team is based in the U.S. and you guys are building a semi-centralized Derivatives exchange, yeah, it just seems lame to me. It either has to be all the way or or nothing. And with, uh, yeah, like you said, the tech stack's a little slow right now. But do you ever see that improving? Like, I guess if you have a one click, sure, for the end user, okay, that's, that's better than five clicks. Yeah, like the Uniswap thing. But do you ever see it being like seamless or you always have to sign it? transaction uh, I, I mean I, I'd like to think that the answer is yes it's going to progress uh, and there's going to be a convergence um, I think how and when is probably the harder question to answer um, sure uh, that I, I, I you know I don't think anyone can really put a timetable on but I think the pace at which DeFi has been moving in say call it the last five years uh, has been pretty impressive so I imagine within the next five years, if we have not converged uh, to a, a situation in which someone actually cannot tell if they're trading in DeFi or if it's a CFI exchange, um, if we're not there in five years, uh, I would be surprised. 
I think the friction though is also uh, like a, <clears throat> an individual's tolerance for how secure their positions or trades are because like yeah you can you could have it be seamless and just have it one click approve everything but now you're leaving yourself susceptible to you know if anything were to happen on uh that exchange or with any of those contracts um you know your your every token that you've approved now being accessible so i think there's there's a balance some people don't mind slight clunkiness to know that you know only the tokens involved with that trade are the ones that are at risk <clears throat> similar to like things DeFi llamas metadex aggregators doing like you can infinite approve an exchange or you can just approve an amount for an for a trade and you know if you infinite approve then every time you come back and anytime you use that that dex within the aggregator you don't have to reapprove the amount for the trade it just becomes you know a seamless click experience um, you know, it's like maybe two clicks. Uh, so, you know, you can provide those experiences to people and, and make it pretty close to, um, you know, feeling like you're using a centralized platform, but th there's always something that you're giving up on the, I think, security side. Yeah. The, the permit to function, uh, or, or contract also, um, allows for time-based approvals as well um, as as well as just the transaction allowance is of the amount of the transaction itself so this idea where you have to sign, sign an infinite approval uh, for a protocol uh, I think should be sunsetting soon uh, I, I don't see that that um, that way of doing things and then having those like uh, left uh, approvals everywhere. Uh, I think there's probably a website somewhere. I think you can like scan and find all the approval, all the protocols that you have approvals on. Uh, so you could actually close them out. Uh, but I definitely think there's going to be an improvement yeah, you can. On, on that. They have those. Yeah. Or you can just go on yeah. and close them all. I'm like the least versed person in DeFi here compared to all of you guys, for sure. Marty, are my coins gonna gonna moon or what? That's what I think that's what everyone's wondering. I don't know. You saw like 1800 break, right? So that was a huge gamma level. And then we popped up to 1900 and, you know, I think that was it. We're already there. Now, I don't know. It feels like we're literally teeter tottering on up only, you know. Sue's back, the super cycle's back, or you know, back to the dungeon. We're teeter tottering on this Dude, every Sue, other day. Rookie, everyone is back. Everyone is back. Not to put them in the same bundle, but all, all, all the the strongest bulls are are loud and proud on Twitter again. Twitter wasn't. No one should listen to what I say. I, I've been sidelined since. Uh, <laughs> I sold the top, and I haven't done fucking shit since. So. Yeah, so, what'd you say? I said Twitter wasn't having a uh, bull posting. I shut down. The... Exactly. Yeah, they shut it down real fast. I mean, you're seeing these huge flows, like I don't know, like in the Paradigm Telegram chat every day. It, it's like. People are buying like 50K calls. I don't know if it's, this is like the Bology effect or something, right? Where like uh, a big figure with a few million followers, you know, and now it starts going mainstream. Like my grandma's calling me like, who's Bology? I'm like, oh God, it, is this the top or is this the beginning, right? And so people are buying these moon boy calls uh, just outright, not like spreads, not uh, besides this one guy, you know, with the 3 million premium, 4 million premium. But 50K, 75K, moonshot, and it's like in size. You know, like, come on, guys, you know, what is going on? Why are you guys doing this? You, you could get a, I don't know, a 35K call, a 20K, a 20, 30K call, and do just fine. But people really like these moonshots. And so when it comes to crypto, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say you've got the 50K straight. Because, you know, obviously every options change across um, 
certain products, you know, work differently. Let's say you've got those 50K calls and someone just hits those up a ton. Um, are the market makers and the people who sold them, are they going to be lifting up the 40s and the 60s against them? Or are they going to be rebuying back those 50s or just hedging them out with the, the deltas and just praying that it doesn't go? Kind of how does that get handled if, if one strike uh, that's really winning just gets a ton of action? Yeah, what what I'm seeing now is like QCP and Genesis like just selling anything, right? And they're just competing for gold stars with Paradigm, who can sell the most every month. It's not like methodical. It's not, you know, even this, like are they going to raise the 40s and the 60s if the 50s is going bonkers? They're not even doing that, right? They're just trying to sell as much as they can to I don't know to make the most money I guess right and but if they're wrong I think I don't let's say end of year we are like 50k you know they have a long time to hedge out a lot of exposure but if it happens sooner rather than later I don't know you get a 5k bitcoin move day right with moves 5k in a day I, I think a lot of these bigger shops are not expecting that Right, it's like a one percent chance yeah. in their head. Like we get like this five k, ten k candle in a day. Mm -hmm. If anything is to the downside, they think that makes sense. And Deribit is actually physically settled, right? So there's pin risk on top of that too. I I lost you there on the end of the question. Um, Deribit is like physically settled, so there's pin risk, right? Yeah, it's coin. It's coin margin, and yeah, coin coin settled. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, right. It's not dollars, right? Um, and it doesn't turn into a future, yeah. right? So yeah, if they if they get caught on the other end and they're short, yeah, I mean, it, it would have to ha make a huge. It would have to have a big move, you know, to blow out some somebody, right? And just becomes like another. I don't know, like there's not even Genesis lending anymore, right? Like, oh, the big one of the biggest lenders in the game decided to go like mega leveraged on their lending. Well, poof, they're not here anymore. Well, they now they have Genesis trading. Well, why can't Genesis trading go under, right? It's, it's all hypothetical, of course, but, you know, the biggest players in the game turned out not to be the smartest players in the room, which everybody thought that they were. Um you know, we thought they were the most sophisticated investors ever. You know, they're making the most money. Well, not, not, I threw all of that crap out of the window, right? Not, none of that stands anymore. So, yeah, I mean, if, if they're overexposed it's to one side. It's shocking how stupid crypto traders, you know, even, even institutions, retail, anything crypto, you, you, you look at some of the stuff that happens and you're, you're, you're almost in shock here thinking about it. Yeah, Genesis Landing shouldn't have blown up, right? Like, that just doesn't make any sense in my book. But, well, it did, and, and now we're here. So, yeah, don't don't think that any of these big institutional flows or anything are smart money, I would say, you know. I'd say a lot of people still don't know what they're doing. You know, as market makers, we love big, stupid money. That's the just picking up pennies have. in front of the steamroll. I'll get a dollar a day, and then you know they'll just get wiped out of a hundred days. They'll get wiped out in one day. You know, a, a year of waiting, they'll get wiped out. Yeah, it keeps the lights on. Right? Yeah, but what a lot, lot of stupid money. A lot of stupid money when they when everyone has the same stupid idea, um, and you know it's stupid. You still have to get out of the way and respect it. Right. And so anytime things start moving, uh, when liquidity is low and things start going parabolic and people start doing stupid things and, and buying extreme, you know, out of the money calls, um, you have to respect it from a risk standpoint, uh, not from a does it make sense standpoint. Right. Because um, it might, might not make sense, but that's irrelevant to risk. Um, and I think what happens is people kind of confuse the two. And so they, you know, they, they believe the market will be rational at some point and correct itself for that. It looks like an opportunity to you at this current point because the market is irrational. 
but that doesn't mean it can't get more irrational, right? And then I think that's when the mistakes start happening. That's when the smart money starts to look dumb. Um, that's when you see all these people blowing up who you would otherwise say, wow, you know, these are pretty respected people. How did they get themselves in such a situation? And I think the problem comes with just the decoupling of those two points. Um, you can understand risk. You can understand when something is mispriced, but you have to be able to uh, differentiate the two and calculate them properly. And so you, you don't get run over. Yeah, calculating risk is one of the most important things kind of in the trading game. And it's important to realize is like uh, if anyone in the spaces, you know, is kind of on the retail side as opposed to the market maker side, or let's just call it market taker. The risks that you have are, let's say, very different than the ones that Marty and I have in the sense that, you know, if me and Marty, and I'm just using Marty as an example of a market maker, are carrying full inventories and unique ball surfaces and are hedging our deltas the whole way through, that's very different than, you know, one of you guys um, who decides to sell one of those 50K calls. Um, Because, you know, the market makers will like we have inventory from 30 up to 50 K in terms of the strikes. And so um, the way that their risk evolves as you kind of crawl up those strikes is very different than um, the outright 50 sellers or um, kind of, kind of everybody's. And so it's important to really understand, especially in options, the convexity of the products and, and the stuff that you're trading and that, you know, and um, really managing that appropriately one of the biggest mistakes i see with risk is especially when people start getting into like risk parity models and they start yield chasing and so like i know marty we had talked about uh, compression of vol and especially during times where uh, volatility is low you get a lot of people chasing yield and then having to leverage uh, to get even more yield from that just given that the premiums are very low and they're suppressed. And so in order to get that same yield before, you have to put on more exposure. And risk parity models will tell you to do that too. And so then everyone kind of follows that same model spectrum of, of trying to chase this like yield. And so everyone gets caught in the same trade. And it, it's, it's interesting to see, and there's nowhere you really see it. I think you just have to observe the markets on a regular basis and uh, observe the different chats, um, talk to different people. But there are times where you see that everyone converges on the same exposure and it becomes a crowded trade. Um, you see that on the institutional side a lot too. Um, and so that's sometimes, you know, another thing I kind of mentioned to people too is risk changes even when price doesn't, right? And, and so uh, it's very important to know that uh, the risk dynamics are evolving over time. And even if the price is actually moving sideways, that doesn't mean that risk hasn't changed at all or that the underlying exposures that people have been building over that time hasn't changed or hasn't concentrated, right? Or hasn't created a crowded trade. Uh, and so you get these like low periods of vol like we have now. And then at some point you can hit a catalyst and then everyone just gets caught on the wrong side. And, and I know that like selling upside calls, um, and options in particular in DeFi is an absolute obsession. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with it per se, but it is uh, not the most healthy, balanced market uh, when it comes to um, options and, and just in the DeFi space because everyone looks at it from a yield perspective, not a volatility perspective. It's not a volatility asset to anyone in DeFi. It's a yield product. And... Uh, there's nothing right or wrong about that. It's just a perspective. Um, but it can create underlying exposures and concentrations that I think people have to be careful of. Because, you know, as you mentioned with the risk of, you know, as price starts moving, market makers' exposures and everyone's exposure in general starts to dynamically change. Uh, people can get caught on the wrong side. You think it's that unhealthy, the balance in DeFi? I haven't looked at the balance of, of DeFi of sold puts and calls across various venues. I, I think the most successful products are yield products in DeFi. So, I, I mean, it's a bit of a inference I'm making here. I, I don't have like 
hard facts, uh, you know, in front of me to, um, Oh, don't I'm worry. Sure Twitter people. does. Twitter does. <laughs> but just from, you know, perusing around and, and seeing what's out there and just, uh, looking at people's UIs. And like you said, going on Twitter, uh, it's a yield centric environment. And, and so, um, uh, we just have to sort of be cognizant of that and that that's only one aspect of option products. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, until the actual true volatility traders come in. Now, you can't really be a volatility trader in DeFi unless you have capital efficiency and delta hedging. And so I don't think we're going to get it anytime soon until that happens. Uh, but I think it would be a very healthy thing, uh, hopefully for Premia, to be able to kind of get to that point at which we can become the first um, truly more volatility-centric options DeFi exchange. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can be the first to do that. Yeah, I think you want to build more towards pro tail traders, right? Like this pro retail traders, people that actually know what they're doing, that are hedging appropriately. You know, maybe their bot doesn't delta hedge in five seconds, right? Maybe they're still doing it manually. I don't know. Hopefully not. But maybe they are. Um, if, if you can cater to those people, I think those kind of traders make make a lot of make make the protocol a lot of money day to day and then when you get some crazy bull market you know dog money is going through the roof then you know you're just fishing retail right yeah i mean retail is very binary right they're they either come they come in herds and they also leave in herds you know um and like you said the pro tail the type of trader is tends to still be around now there is something to say about like retail using vaults as a product because that is one way to kind of keep them around more consistently and make them more sticky. But uh, retailers interacting directly with options and trading them specifically for a particular underlying is highly cyclical. Um, and that's a little bit more difficult to capture them doing that on a regular basis. So we're hoping that uh, the vaults will keep their money around and uh, allow them to kind of still be participants in that passive manner, in which the the more active traders can continue to trade with that and uh you know provide the liquidity for those products um get their lunch money right and also kind of keep the lights on for us right and and keep the volumes going through our exchange uh keep the order books healthy and deep um so yeah there's a lot of different user types um it's hard to kind of you know make everyone happy yeah, I said that when you guys dropped the long form V3 paper, right? Like, of course, you know, 90% of the people aren't going to read that and understand it. Okay, maybe, maybe 90 was a little harsh, but. Uh, and then, you know, on the other side, like, oh, if you didn't drop that paper first, then all oh, the 10% is going to be like, oh, where's the where's the real data? Why am I reading a you know, a blog post or a medium or something like this, right? We want the the research papers, you know, so you can't please everybody and especially can't please uh, everybody on the internet. Uh, I think we got to wrap, wrap up. Does anybody have uh, any questions for the panel? Little Quant, we didn't even hear from you. I feel bad. I'm just listening to you guys. Um, I guess I have a question. I guess I'm thinking... I guess the question I want to ask is like, if you guys were like big, big, big whales, okay, and say the move before coming up here to 28K, because we were on 16K, how would you have protected yourself at those lows? And now that we're up here, how would you protect your position, your big stack of corn? How would you protect that as well, too? And would you do the bull spread that we saw with 38K or 32K? Does that, that caps your upside that protects you from downside? How would you guys protect yourself if you were sitting on like tens of thousands of corn? Put on a collar. Yeah, put on the collar, put on a JP. Was, yeah, put on a JP Morgan collar in in crypto. <laughs> That's pretty unanimous there. <laughs> I mean, that this question, this question is uh, like you can ask JP Morgan what they're doing. You know what I mean, like they've got hundreds of billions of equity and if, if there's a right way to protect it and to manage it, they've done it and taking those elements into crypto is the worst thing in the world. 
Did you guys see uh, Michael Saylor also bought some corn as well, too? Finally, he didn't buy the top for the first time ever. The first time ever. He bought some corn, and I've seen on his Twitter as well, too, he was also thinking about getting into options as well, too, to protect his positions. Yeah, I mean, imagine he just sold, you know, just, I don't know, just easy, right? You hold the spot and you sell the upside. Okay, yeah. he can make quarterly profit. Every quarter he can make so much money, right, for his company if he's right, um, or for his treasury. I guess he's holding it all in, like, the treasury. But he's so, like, against – if well, I, I don't know if his view has changed, right, but he was so against – generating yield on bitcoin he's like the yield is the bitcoin like that's all i want i just want all of the bitcoin as much bitcoin as i want i don't want to make money on it um if that thesis has changed you know i'd I'd like to read up on it but as far as i know last time he was just the giga chad holder he didn't care right just keep buying dollar cost average at some point, though, you would think he would. You would think that he would be like, "All right, this doesn't make sense to just hold. If I could protect, probably would be the smarter, smarter way, right?" Yeah, Bitcoin at a million dollars. Like, oh, does he just keep holding Bitcoin forever? Probably not, right? He would have to generate some income for his treasury for, or for his business for sure. And I'm just trying to think, like going back to the early discussion, who is like one of the biggest. U.S. crypto holders that I could think is probably Sailor, right? Individual or or um, no, one of the known guys that's like his company individual guy. Who just no, you have character. him and you have Grayscale, right? I mean, and the Department that's... of Justice and, and yeah. the Fed, yes, and the Fed, yes, Department of Justice. Well, that's pretty much it, though, right? Like those are the few people that are openly public big positions. Yeah, without red spot, right? Yeah. That yeah. that we know of. Yeah. I mean, you know, that are public for sure. Yeah, there's like three big players that are, you know, multi billion dollar holders. I don't think the how much does the Justice Department have? A few billion now, eh? A couple hundred After they, Oh, I thought they sold yeah, they captured the so road guys coins, right? And they sold some recently too, I think. That's what the rumor was. Yeah, yeah they, they used to do it, right? I don't know if they still do it this way, but they used to do it like 200K clips. You have to put up 200K to get into the auction, and the minimum clip was 200K. But they sold it at a discount, and this was like five years ago that, I, that pretty, you know we were getting into this. I don't remember the exact number, but I'm pretty sure they market sold like over 9K on the 14th, and then they announced they were selling like another 41,000-something like over the next year. Yeah, it was in DB. DB tweeted about it. Um, he had the he pulled all that data from the filing. They just they're just going to forward that to Ukraine anyways. It doesn't it doesn't help anybody. So, <laughs> that sucks. That sucks. Uh, all right, guys. Well, does anybody have in the? I don't even know from the uh, how to view comments. Oh, there it is. Um, listeners that have a question you can raise your hand we'll uh just bring you up yeah dude people are light on the questions every time we had uh luke luke from Darebit was chiming in earlier king mm, just listen all right guys well cool if no questions then Thank you all for joining us once again. We'll see you back in two weeks. Enjoy the rest of your week. Later, pimps. Thank Love you for having me, guys. Peace out. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Yeah.